Okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor George Smoot with us today. He's going to uh, tell us about uh, the cosmic microwave background. This is basically the area that he is very well known for, and his work, uh, his pioneering work on the CMB has been instrumental in shaping our uh, understanding of cosmology today. And he's, of course, uh, very well known because he has received the Nobel Prize in 2006. And he's not only a very good and renowned physicist, but he's a man of uh, many talents. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Smooth with us. And the floor is yours, please, George. All right, well, thank you and the organizers for inviting me here and for holding the conference. And uh, the organizers, I would mention EO and his own, uh, asked me to give the talk. And I said, I didn't know if I had slides with me or whatever it is. And they said, well, well you know, just do it easy. Just give a historical talk. And of course, that you'll see later that sets up little bristles when people tell you just give a historical part. And uh, But I found out I have so much material that I'm going to have to just do some historical stuff and then focus a lot on the CMB dipole, uh, which is very much related to the conference uh, testing the, uh, the cosmological principle or discussing the cosmological principle. And so the measuring of the CMB dipole is something that caught my attention. In Jim Peebles' first cosmology book, he had a little section, it was barely a paragraph, which he talked about the new ether drift experiment. So he called this the ether drift, because in principle, this is a way to measure your motion relative to preferred frame in the universe. And the big question in those days was, is there a preferred frame? And could we measure that? And when we did calculations, it was clear that the rotation of the solar system around the galaxy should produce a measurable, uh, a measurable signal. And that's how I actually got started in doing these kind of observations. And that's what led to the development of technology that allowed the next generations of experiments. But let me go back to history a little bit, since I was uh, roped into history. And the prediction of the cosmic microwave background radiation was done in 1948 by George Gamow, Ralph Alpha, and Robert Herman. Actually, there were three separate announcements where the temperature came down that, that Gamow made. And Alpha and Herman were able to do a more careful calculation and estimate the temperature of the cosmic microwave background should be about five Kelvin, that is five degrees centigrade above absolute zero. So there's a picture of young Gamow on the left, older Gamow in the middle, and then Alpha, and, uh, well, Alpha on the right and Herman on the left, and uh, Gamow somehow magically coming out of the, uh, the bottle of the primordial material, which was, oops, fancy whiskey. And, uh, the radiation wasn't discovered until 1965. Pincus and Wilson, and I'll talk about them a little bit more, discover this isotropic emission at a wavelength of 7.35 centimeters. They did that because Bill Labs had hired them to see what the background is for a telecommunication satellite they were considering putting up in space. So if that was a black body, the signal they saw corresponded to about three plus or minus a half degree Kelvin. So not so far from the five degree. So Penzias called up Bernie Burke, who was a radio astronomer at MIT, who had heard from Ken Turner about a talk by Peebles, same Peebles as the ether drift, uh, who predicted the universe would be filled with five Kelvin radiation. Peebles redid the early calculation of the gamma L and came out with a similar kind of result. And the confirmation actually came very quickly and unexpectedly because there was already a measurement that people didn't know how to interpret. Um, from 1939 to 1943, Dunham, Adams, and McKellar have been measuring the rotational excitation of cyanogen molecules in diffuse interstellar clouds and from the absorption of starlight. And Hertzberg wrote in his standard book on the interstellar medium, for the intensity line ratios, a rotational temperature of 2.3 uh, Kelvin follows. He didn't say Kelvin, but whatever. The excitation of CN molecules was remembered by three separate groups. And Bernie Burke and George Field, Pat Thaddeus and Nick Wolf, and Isof Schlosky 
in the, in the Soviet Union at that time. And they all remembered it and they all dug it up and they all say, yes, this supports me. The next thing that happened is Dave Wilkinson and uh, John Roll made measurements at three centimeter wavelength from Princeton, which agreed with, uh, with the Penn System Wilson result. And soon after that, there was a measurement by Jack Welch and colleagues from the Berkeley Radio Astronomy Lab. So one year after the discovery, so not that many months actually, uh, less than 12, you, this plot was made, and as you can see, it's a handmade plot uh, drawn with a you know a ruler and pencil and pen or whatever it is, which is the brightness versus the frequency, and you can see that two points now from Penzias and Wilson, they had a second receiver they got in, Hal and Shakespeare who measured the temperature nearby and the galactic background, and then the Roller Wilkinson and the Jack Welch at all points, and the CN and a CH measurement. So by 1966 we knew that this was something that in the Rayleigh genes region was well described by a three Kelvin black body. And the question was, does it turn over or not? And that took longer to establish. So there was a lot of progress on understanding immediately and this got accepted and it made a, a big deal. And it's the beginning of the acceptance of the Big Bang model as the correct model. So here's a picture of Penzias and Wilson. They made the discovery in 65, 13 years later, they got the Nobel Prize. That's pretty fast. And another 11 years after that, they got made into a historical national monument. So unfortunately, my laboratory destroyed our setup before the 11 years went by, so I don't have a historical monument. But here's the, here's the antenna, the one they were standing in front of, and they actually have kept it as a, as a souvenir or a, as a monument to Bell Labs. And here's an older picture, and you can see the scale of it. You can see scaling from the door size and everything. You can understand why they were able to rotate and everything. But the key thing I'll show you from the inside. So it's a big antenna. It was Bell Labs had funding to let them have the big antenna and I had the technology for it. But they had one other thing that was important. Here's a picture that I took in the Deutsches Museum of the original equipment, Penzias when he was young, uh, a child would go, well, living in Munich, and would go to the Deutsches Museum and that inspired him to go into science. So two things that you will note. First on the left is a strip chart recorder. They did not have computers in those days. The data were recorded on a strip chart. I have it on another slide, but I won't show it to you. The actual data where they go and they measure the strip chart chasing and then measure the different levels for the different uh, you know, looking at the sky, looking at different angles in the sky, and looking at the load. And the critical other thing that Bell Labs made possible is this shiny thing hanging down in the middle. I don't know if I can point to it. This is a liquid helium door that allowed them to have a reference load at a temperature of three Kelvin. That made it very easy to comparing, switching between looking at the sky with a three Kelvin signal plus a one Kelvin atmospheric signal, and a liquid helium load which at room temperature was 4.2 Kelvin, but the, that's the kind of thing. That made the measurement very accurate and very precise. And uh, so it was also a very nice for uh, Penzias when he was head of Bell Labs to give the Deutsches Museum this, this uh, equipment. Okay, so the other people who were coming along shortly behind it is Dave Wilkinson's group at Princeton. So here's a picture of Dave Wilkinson on the left. And here's a picture of his three different radiometers for measuring the brightness of the sky on White Mountain, which is in California, sorry, uh, and where I did, do measure, did measurements uh, sometime after that. And here's the basic concept. You see the apparatus. You put ground screens around it and a reflector. One antenna is pointed down, reflects off the, off the big flat reflector up to the vertical sky. The other one points at different parts of the sky. And then you <coughs> hold, in their case, a liquid nitrogen doused coal load and measures the difference, difference between the sky and the, the 73 degrees, because it adds it above altitude. And that was the apparatus that Wilkinson was using uh, when he got the White Mountain. Before that, they had a simpler apparatus that they did from Princeton, but the atmosphere is pretty bad in Princeton. So White Mountain, it's high altitude and it's much drier if you go the right time of the year. 
All right, let's respond. Okay, so we 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 started knowing at that point that the CMB was going to be a very small signal in a very large background in noise. And when you start looking for anisotropies like the ether drift, right? The signal anticipated for the ether drift was the velocity of the you know the sun's rotation around the galaxy or orbit around the galaxy, which is on the scale of 220 kilometers per second. That's roughly a thousandth the speed of light. That means you're expecting signals in the three thousandths of a degree Kelvin. Right? And the CMD temperature is around three Kelvin. So you're looking at a part in a thousand. The receiver temperature were at the very beginning, the first ones that I was using nearly 300 Kelvin, but there were a few times 30 Kelvin, there was 200 Kelvin. As, as technology improved, we got our receiver noise lower and lower. But the Earth's temperature is very close to 300 Kelvin, 280, 300, depending on where you are. And that meant you're looking for a signal which is about a billionth the size of the background signal you have around it. So you can't just go out there and point the sky and measure it. You've got to use a lot of technology and tricks. So you want to compare with signals at the same level, the way Pisces and Wilson did. Comparing to three Kelvin is a lot better than comparing to 300 Kelvin. Uh, but you're looking for differences that are part in a thousand at three Kelvin. So even that's tricky. You have to have ways to stabilize things. So you've got to exclude, reject, and average out all the signal sources. Just to give you an idea, Here's a little background, it's much harder to read. Imagine that background is a thousand times brighter, then you start realizing the kind of problem you have. So here's the, the thing that we design. We call a differential microwave radiometer. And um, Dickey had invented the concept of a differential radiometer, but in a slightly different configuration. This is a symmetrized differential microwave radiometer. There are two identical uh, antennas pointing 60 degrees apart but equal angles from the horizon, and a switch that goes between them, and the details of the calibration and all this other kind of stuff. And we couldn't amplify you know, things at high frequency in those days, so we had to have a down converter, then low frequency amplifiers, and then we detected the, the power with a detector diode, pretty much like a crystal radio. And then we synchronously demodulate at the switch frequency to see what's going on. And then we rotate the equipment interchange the antennas to see what was going on. So on the right is an example of that. And I'll show you, it actually was the one we flew to, mon to monitor the atmospheric variations. It has two standard gain horns, and I'll explain the difference of that. And there is a ferrite switch that can be electronically controlled, an isolator to keep the signal from the receiver from going back to the horn and the switch and being reflected. And Wilkinson's experiment, they have a circulator there and they point one horn at the cold sky. So the thing was reflected back to the, to the mirror that way. And then you see the down converter and the low frequency amplifiers and the detector diode. Okay, so the critical thing here is we're looking for an extremely low signal. So that standard gain horn, the one that was this sort of silver covered on the previous slide, if you look in what's called the E plane, the electric plane, it has a side load pattern that looks like this, this crazy thing on the upper right. But if you look at the H plane, you'll see it's much better behaved. That has to do with the fact that the, that the radiation tapers to zero on the edges of the H plane, but it goes uniformly across in the E plane. And if you guys know your physics, it's the Fourier transform of that electric field that gives you the far field pattern. But with a corrugated horn, you force the electric field go to zero at the edges. That's what the corrugations are for. And so the E and the H plane give you similar patterns and they're much lower. And if you look on this plot, you'll see it goes from zero to minus 100 dB. 100 dB is 10 to the minus 10. The signal we're looking for is you know, 10 to the six. So you think going to 10 to the minus six would be good enough. But remember the earth covers half of the sphere. So, and, and your antenna is only looking at a small fraction. So you actually have to have another order of magnitude to in order to even be able to hope to see the signal. So it was development of the differential microwave geometer, the development of the switching and observing patterns, and the development of the corrugated horns that were critical for us to go on to make these next generation measurements. 
Okay, so here's a picture of the apparatus. Now uh, you'll see the corrugated horns. They work at one centimeter wavelength and you see the standard horns. They work at half a uh, five millimeters, half a centimeter wavelength. That's in a thicket of oxygen lines so that you can measure as the atmosphere balanced above you. And then there are two horns. And then you'll see this bicycle chain that goes around it. This is designed to be able to rotate to interchange the horns. And I'll show you how this sits. This sits in a hatch. This hatch has a, a disc that, that stiffens it up because this goes in an airplane and it's the skin effect of the airplane that creates structural integrity for the airplane. And here we've penetrated that with our can sticking down through a big hole. And uh, so you can see the two horns. You can see now the atmospheric monitor has a cover over it. And that cover has two Teflon quarter wavelength windows, which minimizes the reflection. And uh, here's with the cover on, the antennas are looking straight out bare and the other antennas uh, measuring the atmosphere in that way. And this can be rotated or changed, but also rotated to store it with brushes around it so that when it takes off and lands and is not being used, there's not so much air getting blown in because this is flying in a, an airplane that's going at quite high speeds. Okay, and here's the airplane. This is a U-2 aircraft. Uh, the military gave to the NASA Ames uh, research station uh, two U-2s that could be flown for Earth resources. And we managed to convince them to fly us. So that's the U-2, right in front of it is our instrument. And then the other instruments are on either side. All of them are down-looking instruments. We're the only up-looking instrument. And that was good because we, we could fly no matter who was flying, except we needed to fly at night. And uh, so we only got special occasions. Otherwise, they have to make flights for us specifically. And that's a fairly big deal. Okay, And here's the equipment being put in. You can see the can that makes it airtight to keep the pressure inside the, the airplane. And you can see the rigging they have in our special cardboard box to protect their atmospheric monitoring equipment because of the chain hanging down. And this is me and uh, one of the local grad students standing there watching. I had longer hair then, you'll see it in the next picture, even longer. See, I let my hair grow long. In those days, it was like a strawberry blonde, but you can see the equipment going in. That's me checking that things are working, holding my hand over the antennas and everything before we let them butt, finish budding up and get things going. And here is the U2 going out. Uh, and there's a very much interesting lore. This is quite an amazing thing. You will see underneath the wing on both sides, but you can only see this one side, a kind of a red orange colored thing that's help holding the wings up. There's a wet wing aircraft. When it takes off, the lift picks it up and those things fall to the ground and the crew runs out and gets it. Over on the right hand side is Mark Gorenstein, who was a grad student and got his PhD on this project. And uh, you can see behind it a big hangar uh, at the NASA Ames Air Force Base. And here's pictures of the two U2s. The one in the front is a double seater for training people. The one in the back is the one that does scientific experiments. It's flying over the Golden Gate Bridge with the San Francisco in the background and, and the uh, fog coming into San Francisco Bay uh, going underneath them. So quite a beautiful scenic picture. And this is the this is the U2 where you can see it from the bottom and you can see the little ports for the cameras that are looking down to do earth resources like check for fires or you know what's happening on the beach along the beaches and so forth. Okay, and we went and made observations. We flew a series of racetrack courses where you fly down in a straight line, look at the same part of the sky with each horn, turn around the airplane. Meantime, the, the, the antennas are interchanging every minute. And then the aircraft makes a rotation every 10 to 15 minutes. And then we make measurements and we measure the temperature difference of those two points on the sky. And we plot them up as a function of the angle between the instrument and the thing that when we did the fitting, we determined to be the, the as a free parameter, we figure out where the dipole is. And then you make a plot of what the thing is. And that red curve is the theoretical curve if it's simply a dipole radiation if it's simply a uh, first order Doppler effect. And you can see it came out pretty well. And uh, 
So the big surprise was it was pointing the wrong way. The galaxy was going one direction, but this is going the other. And that made me be more careful and look for a while longer before we went ahead to publish. So here is the, the kind of a implied temperature on the sky in uh, and right ascension and declination. Later, the one you, the curve you saw earlier was in galactic coordinates. That was real data. You can see the galaxy right across the center. Here, we only have the data points, and this is a, a, a sketch that was made up because we didn't have good color graphics in those days. We had to make drawings. And here's the U2. Because that was one of the only hatches, there was a colonel that decided he wanted to put a U2 on a pole out in front of his Air Force base. And he demanded that we give him the hatch back. So we had to take our equipment out of the hatch. But at that point, we were through making observations. So we donated our apparatus to the Smithsonian. And here I go to visit the Smithsonian and I took these pictures. And there it's explaining what the DMR is and going on. And then I looked up close and I was like, I was offended. First of all, I wasn't sure that I was ready to have anything I don't go in a museum because how old and historical was I going to be at that time? But second of all, they had to put a sign on the light goes in here. <laughs> but the other thing that was kind of secondary to me is we have these little covers that you see on this side. This has got a little tear in it. These covers we put on were in the lab, so dirt won't get in. We don't we didn't fly with them. But that time the Smithsonian is just going through a kick where they don't restore the the scientific apparatus they live in in whatever state it was in and that got punctured on the on the shipment and they didn't fix it they left the, the hole in the in the thing for what's going on and they also took the saran wrap covers off of the off of the other uh, radiometer measuring the atmosphere so i wasn't sure how i felt about having stuff in this i was proud to have it in the museum but i wasn't sure how i felt about being old enough to have stuff in the museum Okay, so the best fitted dipole anisotropy was one that was a little over a part in a thousand, three and a half millikelvin to minus three and a half millikelvin in this region going towards Leo and, and, and leaving Aquarius. Now you'll see the best fits are slightly different from that now, but it's, they're within the error bars. Okay, and this was showed slightly in the, in the talk earlier by Sabir. Um, this is a plot that I made up at the beginning of Kobe talking about what the various components were going to be that explains the CMB dipole. And uh, Kobe is in a near polar orbit, 99 degree inclination orbit. Uh, and it's orbiting around at 7.4 kilometers per second. The Earth goes around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. The Milky Way goes, the sun goes around the Milky Way at about 220 kilometers per second. And Andromeda and the Milky Way are actually orbiting each other around our local center group. You can add that together. It, it, it doesn't work out. It's not enough. You need, because the direction we're going is almost opposite from the, the, our direction of orbit around the um, Milky Way, you have double the necessary velocity in order to get 300 kilometers, uh, 370 kilometers per second going the other way. And that meant the whole local group must be moving at 600 kilometers per second. And you start wondering what could be causing that. You know, we started looking, well, there's a Virgo cluster and the Hydro Centaurus supercluster, and the Great Attractor was then proposed. There was all the stuff, and there were more Great Attractors. And that's part of the issue of the conference. How, how far do you have to go to get homogeneity? Is that 600 kilometers a second a really large number compared to what you would expect? Or is it a two sigma number, or what is it's bigger than the average, right? And so this comes back to what Galileo said, right? move. it means, and yet it moves. And Galileo, uh, you know, muttered this phrase after he was forced to recant that the earth was moving. And uh, now we, we have evidence and I'll show you, we have even more direct evidence the earth goes around the sun. Okay, and at the same time, or similar time about this time period, we realized we should be measuring CMB polarization. So on the left is Phil Lubin, some of you may know him. And on the right is me still with long hair with our calibrator where we have a polarizer and a black body radiation and we, a black body, and we stick it out and compare it to the dark sky and then we have a gain change and so forth. And the person on the left is Hal Doherty. He was our master technician designer. He made all of these things work. And 
when I told him the first time, rush it, let's make it so we have one that can point up. And then I started wanting to point angles. He made this new fancy one for the new student to at least the hospital to be able to be, make measurements. And this is a measurement that, that's done at, at three centimeters. And then there's another one at, at, uh, at three millimeters and that's not shown here. Okay, so as this went on, we decided, well, we do understand this. There's a question in, if it was easy enough to find the dipole, we should map it better, and then we should see if there's a quadrupole. And so we thought, well, we'll build balloon gamma with a special detector, but we're going to have to make it more sensitive and more whatever it is. And so our, our decision was we had to go with cool receivers. And so there's a sketch on the right that shows the balloon, the concept of the balloon gamma, where we have a ladder running up to the balloon and so forth. So we can rotate the motor against that and cause the gamma to rotate and scan around the sky. So we're scanning around the sky. And then we have a chopper wheel, a cheese slicer or whatever, that comes around and either reflects it. So we're looking off 45 degrees that way, or we let it go straight through the hole, and it's looking 45 degrees at the horizon the other way. And then the whole thing goes on. So that was our concept. Here's the apparatus, again, a corrugated horn. Now three scale to three millimeter wavelength. And it's put together in a more sophisticated kind of detector because this one's cooled. There are advances in technology. And uh, it's also smaller because it's three millimeters instead of one centimeter wavelength. And uh, here's another view. You can see the corrugations. You can see the, the layout. And all of this sits in and sits on the liquid helium cooling, uh, except for a little bit of spacer. But we cool everything down uh, to pretty much a low temperature. And then there's a liquid nitrogen shield around that, and then the room temperature doer. So here's the equipment. You can see the inner shield uh, and the cables and the feed throughs where they're tied to, where it's the, the liquid helium uh, temperature and a special snout that, that, that Hal manufactured with a, now a window on it that we designed carefully that would withstand the vacuum and the antenna. You can barely see the antenna sticking through through the, the window. And uh, this whole thing is, is set up that way. It's flipped over. Now you can see the top. There's a center port, which is for liquid helium, an outer port, a further out port, which is for liquid nitrogen, and then absolute pressure valves and sa safety issues, and a place on the left, a can on the left, that had some of the room temperature electronics. You can see the ground screen, this big shiny area over here on the right. And you can see the chopper wheel and you can see the horn that's, that's here. You can see it reflected in the chopper wheel because this is light aluminum. It reflects like a mirror and it, uh, it points the thing up the 45 degrees in that direction. And uh, so when the chopper is not there, it points out directly at the 45 degrees the other way. So here it is set up and you can see the chopper wheel. Eventually we put a guard around it, but we were in a rush to get there for the right flight season. So we put it together as quickly as we could. And this thing you will see is our idea of a calibrator. This is a, an important uh, and mechanical invention. It flips up and gives us a little tiny black body whose temperature we know, it's temperature we measure, and we know it's, it's we know what the outside temperature is anyway. It's, it's got emissivity near one, but it only fills a small fraction of the beam. So it gives us a signal that's about one Kelvin that we can use to calibrate uh, our apparatus. Okay, now at the same time we're getting ready, uh, Dave Wilkinson's group at Princeton was preparing a large scale uh, anisotropy experiment and their approach is somewhat different. They don't cool their horns. You can see uh, two sets of their three sets of horns, uh, but this is what they had right at the time. And then they go in through this various waveguide and, and uh, isolator stuff, and then the receivers down below are cooled. And so they have to have a special window on the waveguide that uh, lets them keep from condensing things inside of the cryogenics. So Peter Salson was the grad student who was there, and he's wearing his Princeton t-shirt. And I thought, this is a great picture to illustrate 
two things. First, that it was a Princeton group, and second of all, but he he said, I got to put on my jacket. Now, this is in West Texas. In, I mean, not West, this East Texas. It's hot and humid, but he puts on his jacket. And I said, why are you putting your jacket? Nobody's going to see this picture but me. Well, it turns out a lot of people seeing this picture now. And so this Peter Saul's on it, wearing his jacket, upholding transition. But you can see here the other solution to the question of how do you control your side lobes. So what you'll see is these flare shapes on the horns. And what they what you do is you can make corrugations to make the field go to zero and therefore the Fourier transform. Or you can use the fact that you have to flare out around the metal and that causes currents that back up against it and eventually separate the field and lower your side lobes. And so Preston chose that. And what they went to do is went to the music store and bought musical instruments and cut the bells off of the horns and put them on their equipment. So you can see the three frequencies. You can see the three different musical instruments showing up their behavior. So here's a picture with Peter Salson on the left, David Wilkinson next to him, the balloon gondola uh, up there. And the very first time we flew on the same gondola as they did, because we didn't get our gondola done in time to go for that, that part of the season. You have to fly when the winds are turning around at high altitude, otherwise you drift out of, out of range too quickly. And so they were very polite and they let us fly with them. And uh, we got data and uh, we began to get a lot of stuff. The people on the right from the National Center for Abstract Research, they're arranging the, the telemetry and the ballast and everything for doing on. The thing goes up over a hole you see over on the left side, the ladder that goes up to the, the parachute and the balloon. And they fill the balloon, they release the balloon, they drive this thing underneath it till it's all hanging nicely and they let go. And it goes up into the sky. And as it goes up, the balloon gets rounder because the atmospheric pressure goes down and the helium on the inside of the balloon expands. So we did three balloon flights before this equipment was lost in the jungles of Brazil and only parts partly recovered, mostly recovered, but partly recovered uh, after a long delay. So here is the, the naked map of the sky, taking, you know, taking those data and just fitting it out in, right ascension, in, in bins in right ascension. And you can see the red area is the hot part of the dipole and the blue area, which happens to be on the edges, is the cool part of the dipole. And it shows up very clearly. This is the time where we began to start using the dipole as a calibrator. And uh, because you have an effect due to the earth moving around the sun too, that gives you an absolute number. And while this was going on, I started thinking about making the satellite. I put a proposal in uh, after the U-2 flights to NASA for NASA, NASA opportunity six and seven. And that eventually, and that was for a satellite to measure with three frequencies to measure the CMB anisotropy. But the other two experiments on COBE were thrown off the IRAS measurement, and they put us together in what became the Cosmic Background Explorer COBE. And so this was a breadboard we're making. Now, it looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? You can see two corrugated horns 60 degrees apart. You can see the, the, the switch. You can see in blue an isolator, another isolator, a filter isolator, and an isolator, and so on, and the down converters and so forth. The thing you'll notice in the background of those of you that are old enough to think about it, you will see some of the latest technology that existed in those days filling my lab. Right behind it is a teletype. That was really advanced because you could get a printout copy of your stuff. But that's what people had before they got the thing on the right, which is a CRT terminal that allows you to, to type into it and uh, see it on the screen, what's going on. And on the left is one of the very first large-scale integrated circuit computers. And uh, that's uh, and, and above it, two big disks, big for those days. Uh, I think my portable has more, more disk space than, than those guys did. But that shows you the level of technology that we had. That's why I was worried about the, you know, whether I could give this historic target, because part of the parts about the dipole uh, only exist on view graphs. But, and for people that don't know what view graphs are, there's these big sheets of plastic that have things printed on them. So you can put them on a transparency table and project them on, on the screen or slides. 
Okay, the other thing we started doing uh, at this time was measuring at White Mountain, very close, just, just above this on the hill where I take the picture is where Wilkinson was doing his observations, is the measurements to measure, you know, I mean, equipment to measure the spectrum of the, of the cosmic microwave back out in the critical area where we're making the observations. So on the far right is Giorgio Cerrone's group from Milan, and that's a 12 centimeter by length. And the middle is, is uh, uh, the Bologna group, uh, Random Analyze and colleagues. And there's a six centimeter wavelength. And then there's a little good helium door where I'm standing there with the red hat and the purple coat. And uh, behind that is a three centimeter and then a one centimeter and then a three millimeter wavelength set of radiometers. And behind that is Bruce Partridge standing at the atmospheric monitor from Harvard College. And so we just made this little railroad track so each of these things could be rolled over and put on top of the liquid helium load and operated. So we could compare the direct sky with the liquid helium load. Now, the problem is these things are big. So you had to have something that was big enough for that 12 centimeter just as well as it's going to work. And so here I am, it's Scott Friedman and Alan Benner. Alan Benner is operating the shutter. The heat load from 300 Kelvin going into the door would boil the helium right away. So we had to put metal things above it. And we had an antenna that can point at the, rotate and point at the sky or down and point at the liquid helium. The other antenna looks off of the reflector on the left and looks up at the vertical sky. And then we took these pictures because it was a cloudy day. We couldn't take data. And then if that wasn't enough, we thought we'd go to the South Pole and make more observations. So here's the Italian and American team at the, at the actual physical South Pole. And uh, when we went down to make the observations, and this is me, you can tell it's me because my name is right here, right? And that's frost in my beard. Now it's gray, but in those days that was frost. And here's the crew out at our site. We didn't actually work right at the South Pole because there was too much activity there. We went about a kilometer away out in the middle of nowhere. You can see the horizon. It's a horizon looks like that in every direction. And we built this, you know, this platform with uh, reflectors on it and then a pit and uh, the liquid helium door stuck down in the ice. And here's an example with Marco Bersinelli. Some of you heard of him. So he was deputy PI uh, on uh, Planck and Mark Venzadun, who was uh, now running a company. But here we made our own corrugated horns in a rectangular kind of size. Oh, and you're down there for Christmas because that's when it's warm. And so you don't, you're gonna miss it with your family. So we thought, how can we do a Christmas gift? Well, people had to lie down and make letters and somebody had to climb the wind, the high wind sample tower and take a picture. And this tells you about teamwork and about, you know, redundancy because you're only as good as the weakest person in this, in this kind of thing. Okay, and then the next thing that came along on the same thing is the Kobe fire rest. Same basic idea, one antenna that looks at the sky, one antenna that looks at an input reference black body that's made to be very precisely. And you put this in a liquid helium door and adjust this temperature to be very close to the temperature of the cosmic microwave background. And then you have a movable uh, black body calibrator that you can then replace the sky with so that you can compare. And this is the Michelson polarizing interferometer. And Conceptually, it looks simple. In practice, it was a little complicated to build. And here is the whole, the antenna sitting next to a bench. You can see the soldering iron to give you an idea of what's going on. And here's the movable black body. It comes down to a point. So it's got this special, like a wine cork that goes over to keep it from getting damaged. And uh, all this has to work perfectly reliable after it gets launched into space and moved into place. And it's only a question of, when do you have the nerve to put it in in case it gets stuck? Well, let's see. Well, it didn't take much. The first seven minutes of data showed, once the temperatures were adjusted, showed an incredible agreement between the internal black body and the external black body. And also then when the external black, I mean, the internal black body in the sky, and then the external black body. And you see the black body curve of 2.725 Kelvin black body with fire rises error bars 
they've been multiplied by 400. So this radiation really, really well fits over quite a large range, the, uh, the black body curve. So that was it. Uh, it was presented at the uh, January 1990 uh, AAS meeting. John and I took the subway over there and we put the paper in the, in the mailbox there and we went in and he gave the talk about the fire rush results and I'm going to talk about the DMR results, which were not as exciting at that time. Okay, so here are the results from all those efforts. You can see those green dots, uh, which are most of the, of the ground-based results and mostly from our collaboration and the Pencius and Wilson called out separately. And the black line at the top, which is the fire ass, and the DMR three frequencies are also capable of measuring the temperature, although you have to assume that the di you know the dipole is 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 the derived from from the, the original one. So you see it in terms of intensity and down below in terms of of temperature. So I'm just showing it a little more detail because soon after that, the University of British Columbia flew a rocket, which is called Cobra, and gave these curves on top of the FIRAS curve and confirmed that FIRAS was you know it was agreement with FIRAS, but FIRAS has extremely tighter uh, error bars. So we've really now established that the CMB truly is a relic radiation from the Big Bang and it has the black body spectrum. It's extremely difficult to get a black body spectrum to fill uh, the universe. And I'll skip over the you know the extra galactic measurements of temperature with uh, molecules and so on. But all of that fits together. So here's the last time, I think this picture I took the last time I saw Kobe uh, up close and personal. Since I was on the West Coast and we were launching from Vandenberg, they had me fly down to Vandenberg and do the inspection that the ground shields that, that have to deploy, because they're all folded up when they're in the rocket, that, that they were satisfactory and didn't have any leaks. And so you can see the DMRs, the one that was the room temperature, and two that are cold, one on the other side there, just showing it. And this black dome, which goes on top of the liquid uh, helium door, and I usually give a problem to the physics students, when you get into orbit and you wait for a while to outgas, and then you're gonna blow the cover off. How do you do it in such a way the cover doesn't come back and hit the satellite and some other time? So that's a problem for physics students. Okay, and here's what Kobe looked like in orbit three sets of solar panels that are out, uh, the deployed shield, the three DMRs, and inside the debris and the fire ass inside the liquid uh, helium door. And this whole thing is in a, in a north-south terminator orbit. That is, it's on the line between light and dark, uh, but since it's high enough altitude, it's in the daylight all the time. You rotate it around continuously, so the solar cells uh, had to be at different angles to get enough solar cells, but it keeps the, the spacecraft nicely barbecued. And here are the maps we made. The top one, well, the, I should have shown you one more. The, very, the one that's off the top of the screen that you don't see, but only I can see, um, is perfectly uniform. Only when you blow the scale up by a factor of a thousand, shut the contrast way up, then you start seeing some features. You see two features, the dipole, where it goes from hot on one side, the red, to blue on the other side, and the plane of the galaxy, the horizontal line across the center. And you can see this one bright spot, the Cygnus, that's looking down the spiral arm we live in, in one direction, and this is looking down the spiral arm in the other direction. And the galactic center is here. And if you then take out the dipole, remove the best fitted dipole and blow the scale up another factor of 100, you see this. Now the galaxy is saturated all the way across. You're looking down at two spiral arms on either side, but now the like center shows up very strongly. But now you see some regions that are cooler and some regions that are warmer than others. It's hard to pick it out until we suppress the galaxy and you can see a little more clearly. And those are the primordial fluctuations. Those are fluctuations that come back at a time when the universe is at least a thousand times smaller than this now, back when it was, you know, on the order of 400,000 years old, 
as opposed to being you know, nearly 14 billion years now. And it's these that then we were searching for, but these, the level of these fluctuations is around 10 to the minus five of the fluctuations. The dipole is around 10 to the minus three. These fluctuations are around 10 to the minus five for the typical RMS value. Okay, and you can do, you can do the color separation or look at the data in different ways. Here's a nice uh, plot that's got by color. So you can see the CMB is meant to be white to dark and the galaxy meant to be red because the galaxy has more power, low frequencies. You can see the galactic plane, you can see the dipole, see the dipole removed, you see the galactic plane, you begin to see the CMB fluctuations, move the best estimate of the galaxy, and you see the plot at the bottom. And those are the things that we're seeing, the red are the places where it's warmer than usual, the blue are the places where it's cooler than usual. So this was a big step forward because uh, it, it was a factor of 10 below what was predicted from the time of Silk and Peebles' early calculations, Silk's argument, but then Peebles also did calculations that we could expect stuff at 10 to the minus four. It wasn't until we started getting below that that cold dark matter became a relevant kind of thing. Now, if I had more time, let's see, I did, let's see what time I have. Um, hey, uh, I would be grateful if you can wrap it up in five minutes so that uh, we have time for questions. All right, it's, I don't think I can do that. I'm sorry. I okay, thought I was too fast, but, but we'll get to the, I'll get the stuff that's relevant to the conference very soon. Mm -hmm. So okay, so so please go ahead. We have a ever sharpening view of the embryo universe. So Kobe in 1992 made resolutions about seven degrees. WMAP in 2003 came about three tenths of a degree. So an improvement uh, by basically a factor of 15. And then Planck came another factor of three in 2015, and more results came out two years ago. And we have in progress a whole series of ground-based observatories for the Simons Array, polar bear, stuff in the Atacama telescope, uh, South Pole telescope, a bunch of stuff in progress, and the Ali CPT Tibet telescope. There are four places on Earth where you could hope to make these measurements on a small linear scale. They are the South Pole, there have to be high dry places. The South Pole is high and dry because you're staying out two kilometers of ice. The Andes are very high and they're very dry because of the way the prevailing winds go. Uh, the mountain range behind the Himalayas is also very dry and Greenland up until now has been very dry. And so those are the four places. Somehow nobody's set up to make observations in Greenland. Yet. And we're expecting around 2027 to 2030, another satellite to try and measure with much more sensitivity called Lightbird uh, in about the half degree range. Okay, so that's because it's been very, very productive in terms of our understanding cosmology. We have a temperature anisotropy shown at the top on the right. You can see a dotted line, which is the predicted best fit model with six parameters. And you can see the data points. And then you can use that model to predict what you should see in terms of E modes of polarization. Polarization can be E or B modes, depending on what the pattern of the polarizations is. The E modes then fit extremely well on that model without any fitting or adjustments. That's just what it is. And the B modes, you can predict absolutely from the first set what the, the gravitational lensing of E modes and the B mode should be. And there again, you see some of the data that exists. Now, what people are looking for is to try and find some additional signal, which would be from gravitational waves in the early universe. So that's one of the reasons that more stuff is going on. Okay, so let me then get back to the dipole. This is the part I put in. So the Kobe DMR observed the CMB dipole modulation from Earth's orbit. So if you measure each day during the mission, the dipole and do your best fit and see what the amplitude is, you'll see it follows a sine wave. And that's because the Earth is orbiting around the sun at 30 kilometers per second. So six months apart, you have a difference in velocity that's 60 kilometers per second, approximately. So you can fit that and use that as a calibration. Down below, unfortunately, not showing out very well, but it's the only plot I happen to have with me at the time. It's the same plot for some of the Planck data, but you can see this way, way more sensitivity to the air bar, so much smaller. 
That's why the calibration can be very good. But this shows you the dipole isn't constant in the sky. It modulates depending on how you're moving. And that's because most of it's a kinematic effect. And that's what I have to demonstrate to you. OK, so the Kobe FIRAS spectra, you can see the monopole. I showed you that very carefully. But if you look carefully and fit to the dipole, you can see a spectra too. And it's just the, the intensity derivative times delta t. And uh, you can compare that to the galaxy or other things. And it's, uh, it, 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 it's clear that it's consistent, but we don't know. So we didn't know at the time when we first were doing it how much of the dipole was kinematic and how much might be primordial, even though extrapolation would tell you about uh, 10 to the, you know, something on the order of, of, of 0.1 to 1% 1 of the, of the dipole should be primordial. Okay, so now let me talk about how we actually can test this. So the aberrational light, which was mentioned earlier in the conference, but the aberrational light gives you a handle on how to measure whether it's kinematic or not. So the, the analogy here is rain is falling vertically and you're standing still. You just hold the umbrella up above you and the rain comes down in a cylinder around you. But if you start running, you have to tip your umbrella at an angle because it leaves a, a cone behind, which is uh, a, a cylinder behind, which depends on your velocity as well as the downward velocity. So the same thing is true for light. If you have a, a station, if you happen to have a stationary Earth, uh, you can point your telescope at a star, and then you have your Earth moving, you will see that you need to tip your telescope in order to take into account what's going on there. And there's a simple formula uh, for the relativistic aberration, which has to do with the relative velocities. Or you can see this nice little plot of the light coming straight down and versus the light that appeared to come at an angle, or you can do the kind of diagram there. And uh, what happens is if it was a very high speed, you would realize that a uniform flux coming into you will not look uniform if you're moving. It will be brighter and there'll be more stuff in the front and less, it'll be dimmer and there'll be less stuff in the back. And so this plot shows you tilted on the upper right, a tilted telescope, and you'll see this thing just go straight down because the telescope is moving. If you try and keep the telescope pointing straight up, it'll hit the edge of the, of the thing. So this aberration is important, but it's a small effect, but it's measurable because we now have very good measurements. Okay. So this, the C and B aberration and the Doppler effect are both potentially observable. And you can then go through and do the calculations and you can see what's going to go to happen. You're going to see if you had what you expected to be a sort of an isotropic random distribution on the sky, if you're moving, it's going to be bunched up in the direction you're going and it's going to be diluted in the direction you're leaving. Okay, so here's an exaggeration of that. Instead of now moving at a thousand the speed of light, this is using 85% the speed of light. So you can see the hot spots all appear, you know, concentrated in the direction you're going, and the cool spots or no spots are concentrated in the direction you're leaving. Okay, so the issue is this is going to shift the effective wave number that things are at. So at L equals a thousand on one part of the sky, it'll be shifted to 1,001, and the other part of the sky, it'll be shifted to L equals 999. And you can actually measure this. So you can measure this aberration caused by the kinetic motion. And so you use the kind of number that you would expect, the 1.23 times 10 to the minus three or the 369 kilometers per second. And you can then fit and find out what the best fit and it's not to be uh, did you take the anisotropies you measure on this primordial anisotropies you measure on this guy? And you fit and you see what kind of answer you get. And the answer is, as you make more cuts and you quantify, you zero in. This is the direction of the dipole. This is the direction of the best fit dipole uh, by doing this kind of, uh, of analysis. And you can see uh, the direction in the end when you make these cuts comes out to be uh, within well within 14 degrees of the direction of the dipole. And uh, come on. 
by pushing things along. Okay, so it uh, you can compare it to what people did when they assumed it was all due to kinematic effects, and what you get when you just look at the modulation of the primary line of and you find that you basically get the same answer uh, that the delta v bipole between the the fit to the anisotropies and the fit to the dipole itself is about 15 plus or minus 80, or delta v over v about 0.2 on the axis. And the same thing is roughly true in the perpendicular direction. So I finally got to my conclusions. I, I'm going to skip over. I didn't want to try, and I'm running late. I would have did want to try and explain how you can also do this with the sun yav zeldovich effect, the aberration of the sun yav zeldovich effect, uh, as well as the Doppler changing allows you to also do the fit to this and, uh, and it's a different way that it shows up. But in principle, you can also measure a little bit the dipole anisotropy by looking at the kinematic, di the, the kinematic Sanya Delvich effect with polarization, but it's a trickier experiment. So here's my conclusions finally. In 73 years and 56 years, the CEMB has gone from being a theoretical prediction and the first discovery to now an important tool in cosmology. So this is why I had to give up to the, the history argument. Those are big numbers, and I can remember a lot of them. The CMB dipole was a big stepping stone 44 years ago on the way to finding the primordial fluctuation 30 years ago. The primordial and now secondary fluctuations are a primary tool of cosmology. Here I just talked about using the primordial and the secondary fluctuations as a way to test how much of the dipole is kinematic. So we're now back to looking carefully. Is the dipole 99 plus percent kinematic as we expect? Or is there a primordial signal lurking in there? So far, based on my guess, although I go to the trouble of the soft, putting all the software together and running this again, would be it's roughly a little bit greater than 90% kinematic and perhaps more. However, the large scale universe is isotropic to the 10 to the minus four level. So, because the dipole is to the minus three level. So this already tells you that on the large scale, the very largest scales, but not to the horizon of the universe, you're basically seeing uh, isotropy to the 10 to minus four level. So I stop at this point. Uh, thank you, George, very much for the very interesting uh, talk and the very good historic overview. Actually, uh, it basically shows how cosmology has moved towards uh, precision science. I mean, now we are in usually said to be in precision cosmology era. And well, I don't know if you have any remarks on the precision cosmology, I mean, the term. And what do you think of uh, the H0 tension? Basically, so, sort of putting this uh, uh, precision cosmology into question. Um, okay, well, I'm maybe not the right person to uh, ask this. If you ask, uh, you know, Adam Reese, he'll tell you, oh, yeah, this is very important. It's four sigma going on five sigma now. And uh, if you ask Wendy Friedman, she says, not so fast. And uh, I think there's a, there's a lot left to be done. But what I see from looking through this data, if somebody was really energetic and really cared a lot, they could go back and pick up the, the factor of two, or if they were willing to do a really complicated set, because we have a lot of data from ground-based observatories that only cover a part of the sky. And you have to worry about the sample variants being overlapping and those things. You could push showing the kinematic stuff down below the 10%, that that 90, more than 90% is way, you know, that 90% is my estimate from looking at the data, but that's not doing the full analysis and doing it. But you could probably push it down well below the 90%, perhaps to the 95% level. And, uh, but getting down below the 1% level is going to be difficult, but we'll see what happens. And, uh, but there is room for there to be some variations, and there's also rooms for systematic errors. And so I think we just have to do the, you know, do the science and keep pressing on these things and see how it actually comes out. 
Okay. Uh, thank you very much, George. Uh, if uh, anybody has a question. And we're making uh, this, I have a huge amount more material to show what fancy, you know, uh, instruments are being built now and how we're going from, you know, putting a few detectors on the sky to where the next generation is going to be like half a million on the sky. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's quite incredible how much the field is advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, I see some hands up. Maurice, please. Yeah, George, first of all, thanks for your nice uh, overview. Um, we are recently engaged in a project where perhaps the CMB may be used as a probe to, you know, constrain some exotic physics. Um, I'm wondering uh, what would be the observational constraint in, say, heat exchange with the CMB? Would it be roughly 1% before you encounter all sorts of well established constraints? For instance, if you change the CMB, of course, temperature too much in late time cosmology, you're going to change the age estimate of the universe. So you can't have too much uh, crazy interaction with the right. CMB. So, so what it roughly would be, say, the delta T over T in the mean temperature that would still be allowed by uh, uh, independent constraints. Okay. So what you're saying is, a, it's a there's a trickier kind of answer. I assume what you're asking about is how much energy can you release or take out of yeah, stuff yeah. in the universe? Right. And that depends on the epoch. But if you go back uh, to a very early time, to we're, we're only talking uh, hours or days after the Big Bang, you, you start having restrictions on how much energy you can take in and out because you end up with distortions of the cosmic microwave background right. spectrum. Right. And if you look, so it depends, but Certainly, certainly there are limits already from a redshift of 10 to the fifth down to fairly recently. There have been proposals. One of my former students and postdocs, Al Kogut, had proposals in for a couple of different instruments to measure the spectrum much more precisely. And that can let you understand things. But we're already at the level now where we get some contributions, to slight distortions of the cosmic microwave background due to the silk damping. And, and did I skip over silk? I, I, don't, I thought I'd talk about it. The silk damping of, uh, of fluctuations actually add a certain amount of energy to the CMB during this intermediate phase. And you, you're, you're not quite there, but if you had another factor of 10 sensitivity, you would be putting a limit on the silk damping. And, what we what people generally do is they don't worry about stuff on the really small scale. Um, they either cut it off or they say what's going on. But it's actually a constraint on inflation or double inflation and so forth to uh, that they don't distort the spectrum. And so it's not from the delta T over T, although there are ways that you can see it in delta T over T. It's from actually making measuring the shape of the spectrum very precisely. So you could expect, depending on when you add it, you can expect either to change it from black body radiation to, to a Bose distortion, you know, because now the number of photons are preserved after, after you've passed the radiative phase of the universe, which is somewhere around the, the redshift of 10 to the fifth, uh, out to where you can have the Y parameter. And so one of the things I was looking at was does making careful measurements of the Comptonization parameter and the kinematic as Z allow you to have, uh, you know, some additional information about the isotropy of the radiation and distant clusters of galaxies, because you can see the sun yai zeldovich effect out to, out to essentially any redshift, and because uh, it's sort of redshift independent. And uh, you can determine, but it's tricky because other things happen. There are other secondary sources and so forth. But the, the, and that's why I think the combination of that with polarization could let you push the kinematic uh, fraction of the dipole down uh, to, to being more and more total. Uh, but I don't know. So the answer is you have to say how you're going to put that energy in and what are you going to do with it? How is it going to interact with the, with the CMB and with the, the background of baryonic electronic? Yeah, so background. I was thinking about late time cosmology. 
like the delta z or right. a, delta z or the unity down to z is zero right it's clear you can put stuff in starting in a redshift of a few yeah you're able to do that because you have the reionization but if you look carefully if you just had more money and more sensitivity right a little bit more sensitivity but mostly more money but you would be able to see the dead effect of reionization okay uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, George, just to, thanks very much for the talk. Just to follow up on Shaheen's question, right? So if we look at Hubble tension and we look at cosmic shear, and then if we even look at like super Sarkar at all with the cosmic dipole, right? So what we seem to have is like a mismatch between CMB, the universe defined by CMB, and then the late universe, right? Do you think that there's something interesting going on there? Like Joe Silk had a let's say, um, more or less like an essay a few weeks ago with, I think, Ofer Lahav, where they were basically saying, if you've got two to three sigma and a few different observables, you should take it seriously. Um, like, so what you've been discussing is basically whether the dipole is purely kinematic or not, like basically purely due to our motion, which is possible, right? Um, well, I, I set that as my goal, because if you do that, uh, Two of your speakers may, I don't know if they're on or not, I, but I have to look and see. But uh, Martin and Sogers were, uh, along with George Ellis, wrote a paper back in 1994, 95, after I had been, I don't know if they know this, I was bugging uh, Ellis because we were teaching in cosmology school regularly together. Uh, I was bugging Ellis to prove the 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 almost uh, EGS theory, theory, which is if you can show your your anisotropies and shears and so forth and below a certain level, then you can show you just have a perturbed FLRW uh, metric. And uh, so they wrote a very nice paper showing, based on the ten to the minus five measurements, that 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 was sufficient to to do that. Now you guys are talking about different Bianchi types and so forth. But in fact, you're, you, 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 if you have general relativity and so forth, you're kind of, a, you kind of have a problem uh, if, you, if you can find an epoch in which all fundamental observers see the same isotropic uh, kind of background to go the right frame. Or if one grad student watches for all time, then you can prove that it's a, a Robertson Walker metric. And, uh, it's uh, it's hard on the grad student, but it's uh, we've been looking, we've been watching now for more than two decades, so we're slowly making progress. But but the fact is, uh, you have to think how carefully, you know, what are the assumptions? How carefully uh, are you willing to push things and do it? It it's a uh, uh, it's a continuity thing. The 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 Hubble controversy. Mm -hmm. has to do with extrapolating measurements in different epoch down to the present epoch. And that's because the people who are doing the nearby stuff always insist on calling it H0, the Hubble constant. Well, it's not a constant, right? It's a Hubble expansion rate. I tried for years to convince people to call it Hubble expansion rate. I lost that battle. And, uh, but because of that, people think it's a number. It's a famous, it's a, but it's clearly not. It's clearly changing with time. And if you look, there's a smooth curve that fits down that the beta points have got to lie on. And there is a, what you're saying is, if that smooth curve doesn't have a high enough fast rise to go in, the nearby stuff doesn't want to fit on the same curve, it's going to fit on the further away stuff. And uh, I think that that's possible, but it's a question of, are you saying we live in a special bubble? Well, we do live in a, a special bubble in terms of being a place where it's a plasma bubble, uh, well, a yeah. but you know there are arguments about if we live in a void, we don't need the dark energy. We just, you know, it just looks like it's accelerating, right? Right. And so, George, so, just to bring it back, right? So, if we have discrepancies between CM, like stuff we infer, infer from CMB, and then different observables in the late universe, and three different observables in the late universe, 
like would you say something interesting is going on or i i think it's possible i think you keep studying and see what's going on okay. i also think there may be some misunderstanding it's possible we don't have the theory right or it's possible we don't have some of the parameters right okay. you know or it's possible it's just there's some systematics going on so, so um, in, just to get back to the kinematic thing in the dipole i mean it's possible that it's purely kinematic it's possible that it's 99.9% .9 kinematic. And one of the things, and, 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 and Alexei sort of referred to it, it's very, in a paper we did uh, with the Raj Haraja, uh, it, um, you, you kind of think that if inflation is correct, so this is a prejudice, but anyway, that we, you know, barely outside the horizon, is inflation got to be turned off or whatever it is, and and uh, you know we'll get started. And so the fact that the quadrupole is low makes you wonder: is the dipole mm -hmm. high or is the dipole mm -hmm. going to be low? Is there a turn down? And it has to do with the startup of inflation and so forth. So there are interesting questions mm -hmm. about if you could really determine. But I don't know we're going to get that, you know, to a factor of a thousand, a factor of, you know, maybe one percent. It's probably a reasonable thousand seems difficult but okay okay thank you thank you uh, okay george there are two questions in the chat i don't know if you can read them if not yeah. i can read i have to look for it yeah oh there's a q a yes yes right okay okay can the aberration and modulation effect be seen in the polarization as well as the temperature so the answer is I didn't think about it in the polarization. Uh, I have to confess that before we got to looking for the aberration and the Doppler effect in the primordial fluctuations, I first thought we should be looking for the second order Doppler effect because it's a relativistic effect. There's a part that's proportional to the velocity beta V over C. There's a possible another quadrupole term, which is you know, going to be proportional to beta squared. And uh, I was thinking we should be looking for that, looking for the modulation of that. And then uh, it became clear. Uh, so I, I talked about this to Anthony Lanzenby, but his colleagues at Cambridge made the suggestion of using the CMB primordial anisotropies and looking for it. I didn't think about going to do it with the polarization. You probably should be able to see it. But if you look at the power spectrum for the polarization, you see how it peaks up at a half a degree and the already time by the time you're getting down to this this uh, uh, let me think about it say it uh, tenths of a degree it's already starting to roll off some but it's not gone so it's possible so the aberration is really changing things at an angular scale which is on the order of a thousandth right in terms of radiance and so you're looking for features that are on that same scale in order to be able to really distinguish things. That's why it's it's uh, important that Planck was able to go to the very high Ls in order to look for the for what's going on. Otherwise, you're trying to find those lower L peaks and center find them much more precisely. Well, there are, you know, above L equals 800 is silk scale, that things are starting to damp away exponentially. So L equals 1,000 was kind of the sweet spot. But you could, you know, possibly do better. But then you start having the cosmic sample variants come to get you if you go to try and go to the really low Ls. The polarization, I haven't put the numbers in. I had to think about it. Uh, it's because uh, Subar hadn't motivated me sufficiently to think it was worth trying to get a grad student and a postdoc to pull the software up and work on it because it's non-trivial to do these kind of calculations. It's a it's a lot of work. To try and do that, but it's certainly possible that the E mode polarization has gotten good enough that you can start looking for that. You realize most of that stuff at the high L isn't from Planck, although some of it is. A lot of it's from the ground-based observations. So there you have a smaller fraction of the sky covering. But I'll go back and put some numbers in and see if I think you can can do well. But yes, you should be able to get some information out of it. But remember, you're looking for a ten to the minus five effect here. In, in the temperature, in 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 5 effect in the temperature. And when you go to the polarization, it's down similar levels. Right? 
and uh, so it's possible i think it's 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 possible Did that answer enough, or is you have a different question? So uh, we may go for the next question by Bill Green. Yeah. Okay, so Bill's put me on the spot again. What single cause module measurement would you most like to see successfully done in the next few years? Oh, that's tricky. <laughs> I can think of two or three. So uh, for some time, I've had to be a supporter of the James Webb Space Telescope. A little controversy isn't helping that either, because even though it's been running over budget and everything, it has, it has gotten in a position where it takes up the entire budget of the astrophysics line in NASA. And we need to get it done and out and have that line preserved so that there could be new generation satellites coming along and, and do things. However, I have thought of an experiment uh, or observations that I would like to make, perhaps using the JWST, which is using it to stare at and understand uh, what's going on along the caustics of gravitational lensing as a, a probe of what the dark matter is and what its behavior is, because there, you can look down on the micro arc second scale and you can actually try and see what the different kinds of dark matter might be doing in some it. So that's one of the ones that I've thought about. I hope that measurement gets made and that's relatively short term. But the real goal there is how do we determine what the dark matter is? How do we then characterize it sufficiently that we can think about doing an experiment and an accelerator on the ground to prove that it, it has the right properties and, and everything fits together tightly. And you, you're, you're not happy with just somebody discovering that something happened, you know, like the side of the universe is brighter by 10% than that. So you want to actually understand what's the physics driving that? And is that verifiable? Because this is the only universe we got and we don't want to know, we want to know whether it's an accident or not an accident. And so if you start thinking in those terms, you start thinking about, well, then I would like to think about well, can we actually see the gravity waves from inflation? And can we see them in such a way that we're able to probe in and see if inflation really was turned on and running really smoothly in slow roll, or was it starting, starting to go up, right? We know that it's a, the slow roll is a, an attractor for it, but in fact, does it vary from that? Is, it, is there something going on that gives us a hint about what's going on? Because if you if you look at it, this is sort of a minimum number of foldings you need in order to explain how the universe is as big as and as uniform as it is. But if you have too many, then you have an entropy and other problems showing up. And so you've got you've got different ideas about how things might, might go. And so I haven't thought about what's a key one because I still think we're looking about what's the key question for the next level. I kind of somehow think. The HO, the, the, the Hubble uh, H0 controversy will, will somehow get resolved in a relatively straightforward way. And I you know, think we will find someday, but this is harder, a bigger deal, what the dark matter is. But what's the, you know, what what were the what were the things that actually drove the the either the, the real symmetries? or the dynamical symmetries that we see, what, what are those? Those are the questions and I don't know how to ask them quite yet. Okay, thank you very much, George. Uh, I think there are no more questions and it's uh, fairly late in Korea. Uh, I would like to thank you again, uh, Professor Smooth, for uh, your very nice talk. And uh, we'll close this session if, and there are no more comments. Okay, uh, thank you very much, George, and thank you very much for everybody who joined us.